Paper Jordan and for the Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning. We thank you that you are moving among us and that you are all powerful, that you have great plans for us. We pray this morning for Dorbin. Pray that your spirit would flow through him and that things that he's prepared would um, yeah, just flow into our hearts and that your spirit would make our hearts open and receptive to hear from you. And we thank you for your presence here this morning and be blessed this time. In Jesus' name. For those songs, um, may this teaching bless the Lord's name. Um, all right. Uh, there are many things in life that many people who are representatives or kind of like types um, in our lives. So politically, we re we elect people to be our representatives in our democracy, but even in not democracies, political people become like representative of the people group. I mean, right now, people think of Russia, they think of Vladimir Putin, the guy who represents Russia, even though it's not true for everyone. Or I guess on the other side, uh, the Ukrainian president Zelensky is seen as the representing Ukrainian um, tenacity and face of peril. Um, but we have representatives in other areas of life too, like in religion, uh, you know, there's pastors or leaders or, or specifically in, in um, Jewish history, I mean, most religious history or priests who are like in go-betweens between the people and whichever God they were worshiping. Uh, and then there's also like narratively sometimes representatives or like types um, I was trying to think of a good example of this, but for some reason I couldn't get the story of the tortoise and the hare out of my head. So like in the tortoise and the hare, we have the, you, and you can think of these people in your head. There's like the guys, the people who are like the hares who just like go, 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 go. And then they run out of energy or they, you know, they, or the steady tortoise pods long and always wins the race. But like you can, you have like people, you put people into these groups um, and then Jesus used parables a lot to, to, to um, illustrate types of people. So, you know, there's like seeds and soil, um, or very specifically, there's like this parable where the king sends his son to go deal with the renters who are late and they really mean to son. We can connect who all of those people are. Right. I say that to say that in the Hebrew Bible, especially, and in the, these, like Genesis, Exodus, um, this narrative that we're in right now, there are figures that we're encountering who often are lifted up and kind of pointed to as representatives of humanity. Like what they do kind of represents who all of, who we all are. Um, of course, Adam and Eve, right? They're kind of the archetypal humans and their choices that they make, it reflects something that humans keep doing later um, but the generations to follow, there's these individuals, especially the ones that are called out by Yahweh to interact with him that are standing in for us. Um, and and they, they face similar choices to what Adam and Eve did. And they usually mess up, not always, but usually. Um, in Exodus, the entire nation of Israel represents humanity. And that's my one, what I would like to describe to you today or point out to you today. Um, they are kind of like standing in for the rest of us and interacting with Yahweh on our behalf and, and how they act um, reflects how we do and how Yahweh acts in, res in response to them um, reflects how he responds to us still today. I'd like to point some of those things out. Um, the things the Israelites do, we will see fit the common, a common pattern of human failure usually. And Yahweh's steadfast love, despite those failures, forms the, a pattern of who he is, the type of being he is that we still can interact with today. Uh, 
if I'm able to convince you of this this morning, then I would like you to, to see yourself in some ways in this, in their story here in Exodus, the story of these people of Israel who are lost and enslaved without hope, their deliverance from bondage by Yahweh's hand. And then after that, a persistent urge to complain and look back and um, kind of mess things up even after things were set right for them. Um, that Yahweh pers persistently cares for them, loves them, stays committed to them despite this. Um, and we can see ourselves in that. Um, I would like you to see that as we're going through this story, we can witness the Yahweh who keeps his covenant with these people, despite what they do, and um, realize that the same God will keep his covenant with you, despite yourself and your fears. Okay, I feel like we've started a lot. I've started almost every sermon this series in the garden. Oh, there we go. Um, but it really, it frames everything um, for what the story is about. So the Garden of Eden narrative forms the framework for how humanity interacts with Yahweh. The choice by um, these human representatives, Adam and Eve here, was to define good and evil for themselves rather than trust in what Yahweh told them. Uh, and that sets up a repeating theme of that same type of choice throughout, for sure, the narrative of Genesis and Exodus, but I think we can see it in our lives too. Um, but then in response to what they did, Yahweh promised the solution um, that it is in, his, in his curse of the serpent, he says, that the offspring of the woman, a human in the future, would strike the serpent's head after the serpent strikes its heel. And then the rest of scripture is oriented around the manifestation of that, of that promise. And that's, like, that's why there are always sections where it just says, and then this guy had this son, and then he lived to be like 406, and then he married this person, and he had this son and all these lineages, right? Because it's like tracing the line of the woman down through. And then at various points, it, it, it connects with individuals that Yahweh picks to be like, it's going to be through your family. And then we watch it go down through that. It, it goes through Seth, Adam and Eve's third son. And then it comes to Noah, and the world disappears. And then it follows down from Noah and it lands on Abraham. We've talked a lot about what that looked like, the covenant with Abraham. So it lands on, on Abraham and this covenant that Yahweh made with him meant that his Yahweh's plan for healing humanity, for righting the wrong in the garden was now located within Abraham's descendants. Um, it's not all of them because it goes through Isaac, not Ishmael. And later it goes through Jacob, not Esau. Um, but we now are encountering these descendants here in Egypt. So I'm just going to read from Exodus 4, verse 21 through 23. So uh, last week, Kent did the next section, really, that's like 24 through 26. He talked about circumcision a whole bunch. Um, it was really helpful, uh, kind of a survey of everything. Um, and I was left with the rest of chapter 4 to the end. And I'm really just going to focus on these verses and really just one phrase in here we're going to get to. So I'm going to read them. Chapter 4, verses 21 through 23. Yahweh said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the wonders I have put under your control. But I will harden his heart. and He will not let the people go. You must say to Pharaoh, this is what, the, what Yahweh has said. Israel is my son, my firstborn. And I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But since you have refused to let him go, I will surely kill your son, your personal. Okay. There's a lot of things here. This is Yahweh's last instructions to Moses before he finally is going back to Egypt. This is still on, well, no, it's not actually. This is after he left Mount Sinai, but he's getting ready to go back. Um, he's, he actually heads back to Mount Sinai and meets Aaron. And we'll see that at the end of the chapter a little bit. There's other things here, like uh, this hardening of Pharaoh's heart. It's a very interesting topic. We will address pretty extensively uh, once we get to the plague sections a little bit here. So I'm going to skip it today. There's a lot of parallels here between, uh, remember 
chapter one Pharaoh who was killing the Hebrew children, baby male, the males. Um, there, there's a connection here where Yahweh is talking about the firstborn sons of Pharaoh. Um, and there's also a connection with what's happening with Moses' son in a little bit here. Next story down. Um, but I would like to focus on this phrase, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Um, Yahweh telling Moses to tell Pharaoh that these people are mine. I want to just like think about how uh, we got there and what that implies. Okay. He's he's saying this to Moses, the adopted son of Pharaoh, this like fugitive without a place, and he's saying it in reference to this kind of group of people, group of slaves who are seemingly forgotten in this foreign land for hundreds of years. Um, how do we get there? Okay. As an aside. When you read about the Israelites, what crosses your mind? And this may change based on whether it's like you grew up with Sunday school stories or you read those blue My Bible story books or not, or if you had um, sword and trumpet pamphlets in your house where all the Israelites are like little Mennonites. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of things that run through my head when I read the Israelites. Sometimes I think, um, well, I kind of think they're a little whiny and uh, they were like spoiled, blessed more than they deserved or like didn't really respond well to the fact that God picked them. Um, it doesn't really seem fair that God picked them and not other people groups. Sometimes that crosses my mind. Um, maybe, I, maybe I would have done better. Um, but on the other hand, there's another element where I was raised with like these these um, moral tales from the Old Testament, like Aesop's fables almost, like uh, you should be like Joseph. He was honest and chaste, and that we should be like that. Um, or we should be like Noah who believed, or like Abel, not Cain, who did things by the instructions, or things like that. Um, I would like to argue that this morning that the main character in scripture is always um, Yahweh, and it's always about him and how he's interacting with humans, and, and his pursuit of this plan of, of redemption that he set in place despite human failure, and then later despite human failure again and again and again. And that actually, although they are present, usually the good moral tales, like the like great examples, are the exceptions rather than the rule. Um, and a lot of these people's lives that we look at are actually filled with a lot of failure, but they messed up a lot and Yahweh persevered and stuck with them despite it. And then every now and then they, they shine through with like a really great moment. Um, in general, these people, including Joseph, but then like Moses, Noah, Abraham, Adam, all of them who represent humanity in that this story is usually filled with failures um, that display the way that Yahweh loves all of us despite ourselves. Um, often these figures are depicted doing exactly what Adam and Eve did in the garden, which was like choosing what was right or seemed like a good solution in their own eyes instead of trusting and following what Yahweh had told them to do. I will give a couple of examples. One, a really good one that Kent talked about last week was about Abraham and Hagar. So it's like Abraham in Genesis 15 has this covenant made with, with Yahweh. He's like, he's gonna have descendants like the stars. He's gonna bless all the nations, it's this amazing promise. And then the next chapter, he's like, well, that's great, but I don't have any children. And he and Sarah look at each other. And it's like, like Kent pointed out in last week, the language is very similar to the Garden of Eden, just like Eve like took the fruit and said, here, Adam, it looks good to eat, eat of it. Sarah like takes Hagar and says, here, Abraham, I have, we have a solution for this problem. If we just have, if you could, you just have a son through Hagar and we'll just kind of pretend that it's mine. And, and then your line can continue, continue on from there. There, we fixed Yahweh's problem that he didn't get, you know, he hasn't set up for us yet. We're too old to have kids. Um, so that happens. Right, and Ishmael is born, and then all sorts of tragedy comes out of it. Um, 
Sarah gets really jealous at, of Hagar and sounds like maybe Ishmael was kind of mean to Isaac later. And, and they end up like banishing Hagar and her son out into the desert, like to die. That's what it sounds like. Yahweh comes in and kind of fixes that. He helps um, Hagar and Ishmael out. And he persists and comes back and, and renews his covenant with Abraham despite that choice um, with the next chapter, which is, like, like Kent said, it's when circumcision showed up. It almost feels like he's like, all right, I'm back. We're going to continue this covenant, but now you've got to be circumcised. <laughs> what it feels like. All right, so that's one example. We just learned that. I'm going to spend a little bit of time with this guy, Jacob. Um, but it's a story we haven't talked about yet, and uh, I think that it's it's relevant in how Israel and who they are. Um, okay, if you perhaps have been following along in the Bible Project app and reading through the Torah with me, then you have recently finished the third movement of Genesis, the third kind of narrative structure of Genesis, which is all about Jacob, who is Abraham's grandson. Uh, so this would be Isaac's kid, right? Um, Isaac married Rebecca, and Rebecca had twins, and she actually felt her babies fighting with each other in the womb. When I read that, I was thinking about Miranda. I'm like, I oh, don't know, maybe our kids are gonna form great nations because <laughs> a lot in there. So yeah, she's like, they were fighting in her womb so much. She's like, God, what's going on? And, and Yahweh says, Well, let me tell you, you have two great nations at war in your womb and they are going to be in conflict with one another. And he says the the older will serve the younger, right? Which is very like culturally strange because in this culture, whoever was born first got like all the stuff, the inheritance went to them, the, the name kind of carried through them. It was expected that the oldest was the one that they mattered the most. Um, so for the younger to be in charge or over the older was very strange. So she hears this, and then she has these babies, and the first one comes out, and he's real red and hairy, and the second one comes out holding on to the first one's heel. Jacob is like clutching the heel as he comes out. And so they're like, oh, let's name him Jacob, which means heel grabber. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so Jacob's name is heel grabber, which has this connotation of, well, that's what happened when he came out. But it also is like, has this feeling of like someone who reaches out and trips people or tricks them or he's kind of sneaky or sly and that's exactly what he is his whole life in fact like if you read through this story and just keep bouncing back to the garden of eden language jacob and the things he does most clo closely matches the serpent in the garden um, in how he interacts with other people he is deceptive and tricky and he gets people to do things by um, some less than savory means. First, he takes advantage of his older brothers seeming, I don't know, it seems like he's kind of dumb. I'm not sure. Esau comes back from the hunt, field hunt and he's really hungry. And he's like, oh, I'm so hungry. And Jacob's like, oh, I've got this soup for you. Why don't you sell me your birthright? Like your right to being the oldest child. Um, Esau's like, sure, that sounds good. And he does it. Well, he kind of like does that in the same way of like, are you here? Here's this fruit that's so delicious. You should try to eat it. At the same kind of way. So that's one. But that one I kind of put like Esau bears a little bit of blame in my reading of that story. <laughs> <laughs> then he and Rebecca, who has seen this vision and and seems intent on making Jacob the one, you know, fulfilling this vision. Again, kind of by their own means, instead of through however he got the time for it to happen. Says, hey, uh, Isaac said he's about to die. He's like blind and old and frail. And he has his plan to bless, get pass on the older son, eldest son blessing. You should, let's, let's figure out a way for you to get it instead. And they go pretty far. So Jacob's like, oh, no, 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 he's, he can't see me, but he's going to hear my voice and smell me, and he's going to touch me, and he's going to know it's not me because I'm smooth, and Esau is hairy. Okay. Esau is really hairy, and this is important. So they're like, oh, easy. You, we will just kill, hmm, I'm not sure if it's a sheep or a goat, an animal, and put the skins on your arms, and then when he feels you, he'll be like, oh, yep, it's the hairy son. It's the right one. I'm going to give you a blessing. And so he fools his old 
blind death into giving him this blessing. Okay. Which, I mean, it's like, it's what Yahweh said was going to happen. Right? He told Rebecca this is what was going to happen. But was this, was this how it was supposed to happen? I don't know. I don't know that answer for sure, but it really, it certainly feels like Rebecca and Jacob are like reaching out and grabbing the, the fruit that they want and taking it in their own way, doing things the way that they think is right in their eyes. And what happens from this? Jacob's life, by my estimation, was fairly miserable. He, he then is like, has to run away from his older brother who says he's going to kill him really mad about this situation he goes away finds the woman he wants to marry and is tricked and tricks his father-in-law for like a long period of time um, where they kind of play these games with each other and he ends up with multiple wives who then have him use their handmaidens to have more kids and like this competition against each other his family is filled with turmoil he ends up playing favorites and liking some of his kids more than others and that causes all sorts of conflict that eventually leads to Joseph's exile and his arrival in Egypt and why the people of Israel are here. It doesn't seem to be a great one. All right. In the middle of all of this, like I don't find there isn't there is one redeeming moment, but before that redeeming moment, Yahweh meets with Jacob and renews his covenant with him in the middle of it all. Just like he had with Abraham and with Isaac. He meets him in a dream and says, and have blessed nations through you, and your kids are going to be so many kids. Um, this redeeming moment is this strange story where he laughs. Uh, where he meets a man. It just calls it a man, but later the context and like the discussion afterwards implies that this man was Yahweh himself, or an angel of God, or some people. We think it was Jesus, yes. a representative of Yahweh in some way. He meets him and they fight, they wrestle. And the way the text says, it's like they fight all night long and, and Jacob just holds on. And it says the man saw he could not defeat Jacob. Like he couldn't get him to say, you know, whatever, tap out or what's the word? Uncle. uncle, yeah, that's what I'm <laughs> couldn't get him to say uncle, and so he's like, Oh, this is not going to work. So he punches him, he strikes him so hard that his hip dislocates. Well, I'm asking about that afterwards, I'll tell you more details. Okay, <laughs> hip dislocates. And, um, and, and still Jacob won't let go, he's like tenacious. This heel grabber can't grab, he really holds on. and he says, I won't let you let go unless you bless me. This man, he, like, he knows how to get his blessings, right? And so Yahweh says, all right, I'm gonna, I will bless you. He blesses him. He says, from this moment forward, your name is no longer Jacob, the heel grabber. Instead, your name is Israel, which means fighter of God or wrestles with God or in someone in conflict with God. And that's what the whole nation is named later, right? So Israelites is those who wrestle with God. And we'll see. They live up to it. They live up to their name a little later. Um, yeah, and trivia, right? So I, for some reason, that I didn't realize this is so a But Israelites, because of Israel, right? And then a while later, they split into two countries, and Israel gets taken away, and only Judah remains, one of Jacob's sons, and that's those are Jews. Right? So Israelites, Jews, same people group, but Jews are like a subset. Sorry. So my point is, despite all of Jacob's like deception and trickery and inability to trust in Yahweh, he does not seem like a stand-up, like moral paragon of virtue. Yahweh remains faithful to him because he promised Abraham that he would, um, and, and he was intent on keeping this covenant. Um, and it's these people, Israel's kids, that we're about to spend a lot of time with in Exodus. All right. In fact, Yahweh at this point would like Moses to introduce these people as his, as his firstborn son. He is like claiming them as his people. 
Um, and we just flip back a little bit into chapter three when, when Moses first ran and encountered the, the burning bush. Um, right after Yahweh says that I am that I am and, and tells him that he says, you know, you say this to the Israelites and then says, you say this to the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial from generation to generation. Like Yahweh's commitment to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is so strong that he is actually, he's changing his name to be, to reflect them. Those people are now like connected to Yahweh in a neutral way. Okay. okay, so now I just you all watch Prince of Egypt, so the spoil so you spoil the story anyway. So it's fine. We're gonna jump ahead. Okay. So Exodus 19. We're gonna turn to there if you have your Bible. See something that's coming up. So this is after they get out of Egypt and they travel through the desert for a while and they arrive back at Mount Sinai, this uh, mountain of God where Moses encountered him to be given. I'll read the first six verses of chapter eight. <clears throat> In the third month after the Israelites went out from the land of Egypt, on the very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they journeyed from Rephidim, they came to the desert of Sinai and they camped in the desert. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and Yahweh called to him from the mountain. Thus you will tell the house of Jacob and declare to the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I lifted you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And now, if you will diligently listen to me and keep my covenant, then you will be my special possession out of all the nations, for all the earth is mine. And you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you will speak to the Israelites. He then uh, calls them to clean themselves up, do these like purification rituals and prepare to come up on the mountain and meet with him themselves. Um, like a, an entire nation of Adam and Eve walking with Yahweh in the garden. He invites them to come up on the mountain. Um, but they get scared and refuse, so that is Moses. That's another story. This is amazing. Yahweh is making an entire people group, a nation of priests. Um, like we were saying at the beginning, like true priests are representatives. He's calling this whole nation to stand um, stand for the rest of humanity as his kind of connection to the rest of humanity. That's why he wants them to be this like this um, beacon of, of who Yahweh is to the world around him, witness to the world around him of who Yahweh is. Um, God's chosen people, his, he's calling his firstborn son and they're to be this representative of humanity and he's going to stick with them because of his, despite their failures, because of his best love. All right, so keep this concept in your head a little bit. We're gonna, there's a couple things in the New Testament I wanna bounce to. So did that sound familiar at all? This like royal priesthood, uh, kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Um, the, Peter quotes this, these verses in First Peter chapter two, where he's talking about, uh, he is implying that this passage is like now in referring to Christians that he's addressing. Um, he says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people of his own, so that you may proclaim the virtues of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And this is, in this context, Peter's not talking just about the Israelites, but about all the followers of Eve's seed, Jesus, who has come, who, these people, those of us who follow Jesus now, fill the role as humanity's representatives. Now, okay, there's another text that I want us to hear. In it was, it was Jeremiah 31. Kent referenced this last week when he was talking about circumcision, but it's also referenced and quoted almost the whole thing in Hebrews chapter eight. And I actually wanna read it from there. Um, in Hebrews eight, the author of Hebrews is discussing the, 
the covenant with the people of Israel and in comparison to a new covenant that Christians now have under Jesus. Um, I'm going to read verses 8, 7 through 12. He says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, no one would have looked for a second one. But showing its fault, God says to them, and then he's quoting from Jeremiah, Look, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will complete a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I had no regard for them. So that's spoilers further. It's more in the future. For this is the covenant that I will establish with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will inscribe them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And there will be no need at all for each one to teach his countrymen or each one to teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, since they will all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their evil deeds and their sins I will remember no longer. Um, this passage and the New Testament is filled with many other texts that describe those who have faith in Jesus as members now of Yahweh's people. Romans had, in chapter 9, had this whole section of this branch being spliced into the tree um, without the need for circumcision as a marker, as you can't describe it. Okay. When we read this story, um, and we hear of what's happening with all these figures, the patriarchs, Adam and Eve, and all the patriarchs, and then, and then the people of Israel, we should realize that we, our spot in the story, are, we are identifying with the people of Israel. And, um, and then what Yahweh is doing for the people of Israel um, is a reflection of how Yahweh is interacts with us. Um, Yahweh's commitment to his covenant um, that is like steady and consistent, his covenant to Abraham's covenant, is still in place for all of you who are under this new covenant that Jeremiah is referencing and that Hebrews is talking about here. Um, so when Israel fails, we should be seeing ourselves in them and because our humanity matches theirs. And then when Yahweh delivers them, we should see him delivering us because his character remains the same. When we're going through Exodus, right? It, the point isn't for us to like find a couple good actors and be like, oh, cool, I'm going to mirror them. The, the goal of it for us today is to see what can we learn about humanity here and how humanity functions. And we will see that over and over. And then we also want to see what can we learn about Yahweh? What kind of God is he that I'm worshiping today? And we get all sorts of evidence of his continued love for his people despite this and his overcoming their enemies, who is going to be Egypt for the most of the spring, on their behalf, his strength for them. All right. In Exodus 4, again, I'm just going to flip back and we'll, I'll finish the chapter. Um, right after the circumcision moment happens, Yahweh gets Aaron, Moses' brother, to come meet him on Mount Sinai. And then Moses and Aaron go back to Egypt, um, in verse 29. Moses and Aaron went and brought together all the Israelite elders, all the leaders of the Israelites. And Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs, with, like the miracles with the staff, in the sight of the people. <clears throat> and the people believed. When they heard that the Lord had attended to the Israelites and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed down close to the ground. This is our introduction to the Israelites. Um, from here, we're going to see how they, um, yeah, how they, how they do as Moses, like, is Yahweh's representative for them, standing up to Pharaoh and trying to get Pharaoh to get them to leave. Um, there's going to be a lot of conflict and difficulty for the Israelites. 
push harder, and we'll see them kind of grow and develop into Yahweh's people until they they become the people that at Mount Sinai later he like says, "Hey, come on up, you guys are going to be a kingdom of priests." But my purpose this morning is for you to keep this picture of them in your head as these people represent our hope as humans and we're cheering for that we're on their team um, and and as we watch them struggle to follow Yahweh well I want you to reflect and think to yourself like how does this mirror what happens in my own heart and as we watch Yahweh respond to them think to yourself how does this match what he's been doing for me as well I will pray and then Neil's going to lead us in a closing song. Lord, I'm grateful for your, your steadfastness, the way that when you make a covenant, when you make a commitment, you stick to it um, almost always despite our failures to keep our end of the bargain. Thank you for the way you um, care for us despite ourselves, just like you cared for Jacob. Uh, and may we, as we learn more about the people of Israel and how they were rescued by you, um, you fill us with greater and greater understanding, confidence in the, in the kind of person that you are, someone who cares for us. Lord, um, we praise you for being steadfast 